Let's start off with our first presentation. I'd like to introduce you to Mr. James Catto. Jim and I work together in Sheffield, perhaps by chance, but of course he's one of the best people I can imagine to talk to us on what we asked you to talk about, the role of PSA and biomarkers, Jim. And when we talked about this, it sounded a dry old title, and we thought we'd perhaps make this a bit more provocative. So. so over to you, Jim. Okay, so thank you very much, and uh, welcome everyone. And I suspect the lateness that we're now running is due to me and London Underground, so apologies for that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as, as a Londoner, I should never get lost, but you do. Okay, so listen, the role of PSA and other biomarkers. Um, as you'll see towards the end of the talk, there's no great panacea on the horizon. So I think it's more important for us to try and put PSA in its context and work out how we can maximally exploit it rather than be waiting for something that's going to solve all the problems that PSA has generated. Um, there's a lot of backlash and media publicity around PSA at the moment. It's not a prostate specific issue, we're now seeing it in breast cancer screening. Um, and Richard Ablin is a chemist who was one of the first people to describe the structure of PSA back in the 70s. And he wrote an editorial in the New York Times earlier in this year that caused a lot of consternation, talking about the great prostate, prostate mistake, how he regretted having discovered the structure of it, and he regretted having publicised it, because he saw America had gone down a PSA spiral that was causing mostly detriment to the population. And these were some of the figures that he quoted. So 30 million American men undergo a PSA screening test annually. That equates to $3 billion of healthcare costs. 16% of American men are now diagnosed with prostate cancer, but only 3% die of it. Um, and having initially propagated and suggested that we should all have a PSA test, various societies are now cautioning against this, including the American Cancer Society, preventive medicine you see there. He's adamant that PSA screening should not be deployed to screen a population of men over the age of 50, but the questions arise for younger people. Not surprisingly, there's a backlash against that. So these are some of the published comments that reply or that in the letters that correspond to this. 3% of American men die of prostate cancer. That sounds like a lot of men to me. Since my urologist, since my Gleason score was high, the urologist I agreed, uh, agreed I should have surgery. Over the last 12 years, I've never regretted my decision. And of various letters that have been published, there was only one really that was cautioning or supporting Richard Adlin, saying that he felt that the anxiety and the pain that the diagnosis had caused him uh, really was was, was a detriment and he wished he'd never gone down that road. We're not alone, so this is a letter that's appeared in European Urology um, last month or this month. This is from a gentleman in Denver, uh, in Plymouth. My demise was preventable. The horrendous pain I suffered was preventable and PSA screening should, have been, should be introduced as it would have saved my life. It goes on to say that even murderers don't receive a death sentence, whereas uh, undetected men with prostate cancer do. So it's a contentious area, you can imagine. So, my plan today is to try and review PSA, and to do that I think you've really got to put it in the context of screening studies and how we're using it for the vast majority of men. That inevitably is going to lead us into over-detection and over-treatment, and I'll try and come up with some reviews and strategies for that, and then we'll move briefly into what we can do about the conundrum we're in at the moment. So, to go through the biology, PSA is a serine protease, it's regulated by androgens, and it's expressed only in the prostatic epithelium. Its function is to liquefy the ejaculate. It's one of the calocrine proteases, and there's actually 15 calocrine proteases in humans. They're all clustered together in a very short chromosomal region. Is this a pointer? Yeah. They're all clustered together in a very short chromosomal region. And why I, why I like this slide, this is the UCSC genome database. It shows you other species. So you look, elephant has a PSA. We also know dog, mouse. <coughs> The duckbill platypus has a PSA. <laughs> well, that's right. I don't even know what this thing is, but it has a PSA. And the stickleback has a residual. But, but what's interesting is that it's, it's so, so PSA is calocrine 3, which is this one here. Okay. And when you come down through here, what you see is dog stands out. So of this sort of highly conserved gene, and in general, highly conserved genes are important in biology. So 11 out of 15 of them go all the way back to these primitive species. But only PSA, KOKL2, KL, uh, 3, and KOKL2, they're the only ones that are found in dogs and humans. And that's interesting because only dogs and humans get prostate cancer. So PSA typically should reside in the prostatic epithelium, but it does leach into the blood through, en through events that damage the uh, prostatic blood barrier. And as you can see here, it's sort of bound in various forms. Under here, uh, 
It doesn't have an enzymic activity in blood because there's a vast excess of anti-enzymes that bind it, these alpha chymotrypsins. So the vast majority of PSA in the blood is bound to harmless things that are stopping it becoming an active enzyme. What are normal PSA values? Well, as, as we all know, there isn't really such a thing as a normal value, but there is a normal distribution. And here you see one from a Swedish study, and on the other side, this is the UK data. So this is the PROTEX study where we've effectively screened 100,000 men, and these are the initial PSA tests that you see in 53,000. So the vast majority of men have got a PSA at less than one, in that sort of 0.5 to 1 range. Um, there's an age-related change. This is the mean PSA over time in that same population. You see it's going up about 0.75 nanograms per mil per year. And that's obviously the reason why we've come up with a specific PSA. It's clearly related to cancer if it's not specific for cancer. So these are the same data, but now cut off for, for the presence of cancer. Within this study, we've only biopsied people with a PSA over four, so you're missing the tail on this side. But you see here, as your PSA goes up, there's a dramatic increase and a gradual decrease in the number of cancers that you detect. And it goes all the way back to your blood test in your 30s and 40s. So Hans Lilger from uh, Malmo and now New York has done various studies where they've looked at PSA in men in their 20s and 30s. And your serum PSA when you're 20 is very strongly predictive of whether you're going to get prostate cancer when you're older. And here you see the data. So as your PSA goes up, at your initial screening PSA between 20 and 40 year old men, your chance of getting subsequent prostate cancer 20 years later is dramatically correlated to that. And that's an area that he's trying to explore at the moment. So not surprisingly, it seemed fairly obvious that you'd use PSA screening, PSA detection to screen and treat prostate cancer. And as I think you all know, there have been two big studies that I'll review briefly uh, that have looked at this question and have been published in the last 12 to 18 months. The best and the largest is Fritz Schroeder's ERSPC study, where they've screened effectively 180,000 men between the ages of 50 and 74 from eight European states. There are some differences between that and our practice in the UK and the American study, which I'll highlight shortly. Um, the prostate cancer diagnosis was obviously dramatically higher in that population, and the cancer death was lower in that population. <laughs> when you look at the adjusted odds over time, you see that there is a survival benefit for PSA screening, but the, that comes at the expense of overtreatment. And the key numbers are the numbers needed to screen, it's almost 1,500, and the numbers needed to treat is almost 50, at 48. Um, but there were problems with that, as with any study, it's not perfect, there's a lot of men gone into it. These are the uh, potential biases and contaminations that you see in the study. So in the, control, in the screening arm, in the screening arm people may not come, they may refuse their biopsy. And if you're comparing screening and therefore treatment, radical treatment versus uh, nothing, you need people to all have radical treatment effectively to test your hypothesis. So they may not come and they may not be treated appropriately. And what about the guys who get their PSA test when they're not supposed to? So in the population, we see that between 6 and 35% didn't come, depending on which city they're in. 14% didn't have a biopsy. Nearly 20% were just having conservative treatment. And in the control arm, which was the real problem for the study, a third of men had their PSA test. So you have a fair amount of contamination. If you statistically adjust for that, which is a statistically, statistical no-no, but has been done, you, reduce your, you increase your mortality reduction to almost a third. So there's a hypothesis that if all the men had come and none of the men in the controls had been tested, you'd see a bigger difference, but that's yet to be tested, really. The Americans found the opposite. So the Americans had a half the size of the study, just short of 80,000 men, 10 US centers, but there were some differences. It was, at the time the trial was set up, it was deemed impossible to get PSA-naive men. So you were allowed to have your PSA tested before you even went into the study. In fact, a fair number of men had a biopsy beforehand. It wasn't felt that you could be automatically told to have a biopsy. You had to have a recommendation from a physician, and that meant that you had a clinician deciding what went down each treatment pathway, each screening pathway. So as you see there, there are the numbers accordingly. There was no difference in the prostate cancer death between the two arms. But when you look at there, and there's the, there's the graphs for that, but when you look at the contamination in this study, you see that a third of men had a PSA before they'd even gone into it. 5% had a biopsy. In the screening arm, um, up to 20% of men didn't have a DRE or compliance or, or a, a PSA. And in the non-screening arm, almost half the men had a PSA of some sort during their six years, so they were effectively screened. Um, and as I say, in the, in the PSA arm, uh, the biopsy compliance was almost a third. So they weren't really truly testing the two hypotheses, and that probably explains the differences. There were various smaller differences that were important. Uh, 
such as the different PSA thresholds, the different biopsy protocols, but in essence, that you were looking at a very clean or attemptedly clean study versus a, a, a less clean study. In the American group, they powered it according to having no contamination and having a one-sided t-test. By the time they come to their analysis, their power was well wrong. As you see, nearly 50% of them have been contaminated in that arm. So that probably, probably, probably tells us why the PLCO study didn't come up with a positive result, as it were. So we know that screening reduces prostate cancer mortality, but at the expense of over-detection and treatment. So over-detection. Uh, if you look in a medical textbook, you see a dictionary of cancer that it's a neoplastic disease, the natural course of which is fatal. And I think we'd all agree that's what cancer is. Certainly the man in the street thinks that's what cancer is. But in screening, it's not the case. In screening, it's a histopathological disease that we've found by various detection methods. And it's got a variable time course. It might not, might not even kill the person. In fact, quite commonly won't. So over-detection is the detection of these tumours that would otherwise not be clinically apparent during the patient's lifetime. For over-detection, you need a biomarker. Something can go out and find the test, whether that be an x-ray test, a blood test, or otherwise. And then you need a disease reservoir. So we know that between a third and 70% of men in their 60s have got prostate cancer. We know that from two various pieces of evidence. The first one is the US incident SEER data for prostate cancer. And here you see a big surge in the detection of prostate cancer when PSA is detected, so when PSA is introduced. So this is the latent disease that's sitting in the community that's now being picked up because we can find it. If you look at autopsy studies, if you look at men who've died from a road traffic accident or other causes, you see that a very high prevalence of prostate cancer, microscopic or even significant T2 foci in men who are otherwise thought to be well. But we're not alone. Uh, a third to 100% of people have got thyroid cancer. And breast cancer is present in 40% of women in some studies. So th these are really a change in our philosophy for what is cancer and the biology of human disease. Overdetection is a multifactorial thing, and it's to do with the rate of growth of your cancer, the time you're going to follow somebody up, um, and their life expectancy at the time of diagnosis. And that's why prostate cancer does particularly badly in this equation, because it's a slow-growing tumour, so you need a lot of time before you're going to come into morbidity at that stage. Um, we can measure over-detection, and we can therefore estimate what PSA is going to do to our over-detection rate. The best way of measuring over-detection is taking a randomised control trial and looking at the detection in the control arm versus the screen arm. In a perfect world, as you see here, they both meet eventually. So screening has given you that lead time which enables you to treat the disease and perhaps cure uncurable disease. But what we see in most screening studies is this, it's where the two arms don't meet. There's much more cancer in the screened arm than the control arm. <coughs> to estimate that, you need to look at the number of cancers you're picking up using the test. So in breast cancer, the over-detection rate using mammography is probably 24%. In lung cancer, it's 51%. That was even more surprising to me. I always thought lung cancer was a killer, but it's 50% if you screen for people using cytology and chest x-rays. So in prostate cancer, if you do the same equation, you see that our over-detection rate is about 58% at a median of nine years. And that's important because I'll talk about the catch-up cancer shortly. So the numbers needed to screen using those are 1 in 48, as we've seen for the numbers needed to treat. But they're not that different to breast cancer. So in breast cancer, it's about 1 in 24 to 1 in 20. So they're approximately double that, but with a shorter follow-up. So, as I said, are we alone? If you look at the population trends of a disease over time, it gives you an idea whether screening or modern medicine is affecting the etiology, affecting the demographics. So if you see the top curve where both mortality and incidence are going up, then you know that the population is getting more cancer. Perhaps we're all smoking and getting lung cancer. But if you see the bottom graph, then what you're seeing is over-detection and over-diagnosis. And if we look at the US studies for the SEER data of prostate cancer, we effectively see that. So we know that we're now over-detecting prostate cancer, even without screening. But we also see it in breast, thyroid, melanoma, and kidney cancer. So nearly everything we're doing medically is leading to over-diagnosis. And we know in our practice that we see an increasing number of renal masses that have been detected by asymptomatic uh, abdominal ultrasound. Uh, so, will those over-detection rates in prostate cancer specifically stay the same? Is this the big worry that we have to deal with? And there are some evidence that are now emerging to suggest that the numbers needed to treat might change with time. As I've said, the ERSBC has a nine-year follow-up, so we know what's going on at nine years, but we don't know what's going on after nine years. 
There's recently been a study published from Gothenburg um, where they initially started screening in 1994 as part of the study. These patients were later co-opted into the RSPC but initially were a separate group. What that means is they've got nearly 80% of people with 14 years follow-up. They had a slightly different protocol to RSPC, they had more screen, they had more frequent screening, they had a lower threshold and they, they, they screened a younger population. And what we see there is what you'd expect, more cancer in the screen detected arm than in the control arm. But when you look at advanced disease, now I don't expect you can read that from the back, but this circle here, these are people with metastatic disease at diagnosis. And what you see is it's almost double that in the control group versus the screen group. So if you screen, you can halve the rate of metastases at diagnosis. And not surprisingly, they've shown a survival benefit. Now their survival benefit is twice what we've seen in the RSPC. So it's actually, actually screen halves the chances of you dying of prostate cancer by nine years, by uh, 14 years. And so their numbers needed to treat plummeted to near 12. So one would expect that with the ERSPC, we will see a reduction in that 1 in 48. Don't forget, we've seen the first of three potential analyses and reports are going to come out with over time. It's likely that that overreduction will last about 15 years, and I say that from these data. So this is the Swedish study of randomised treatment, and what we saw there is when you compare radical treatment with watchful waiting, there's a difference in survival, but after 10 years, that plateaus. So any change you see is in the first 10 years. Bearing in mind we're now looking at five years before this because of the PSA use that wasn't present here, then I think we'll see about 15 years lag before we see the best results from screening. <coughs> so we know screening improves survival, but it, a massive expense of overtreatment. I think overtreatment is going to be hard to get around at the moment, so we have to work out with strategies of what we can do about that in sort of contemporary practice. And I think there are really three areas where we can potentially reduce overtreatment. We can try and prevent the disease in high risk people. We can try and stop detecting it, or we can try and stop treating it. And that's obviously all our goals, really, is to find out those who need it. Prevention, I think, is the weakest one of these three arms. So there is evidence that taking finasteride or dutasteride prevents prostate cancer. It's probably not applicable to the whole population, but there are certain people who are at high risk of prostate cancer. So these may be people in families who've got mutations like the BRCA2 or the CHEP2 mutations and they've got a 23-fold increased risk of having early prostate cancer. Could be people who perhaps have had a pathological biopsy that suggests they've got early, early cancer, such as ASAP. Or it might well be with sort of more popular genetics that are now coming on board. Traditionally, with hereditary cancer, it was thought that you inherited a mutation from your parents. It was very rare, but if you got it, then you got the disease. So we've seen that many of these are breast cancer colon cancer, all the classic hereditary familial syndromes. If you have a single gene, a single killer mutation, if you get that mutation, you get the cancer early. And people thought that was what was going to go on with prostate cancer, and there have been a number of these described by looking at huge linkages. But the situation really isn't that common and isn't that prevalent in, breast, in prostate cancer. What's more common is actually we've all got lots of very low risk alleles that perhaps adjust our risk slightly. And technology's now moved on that you can now screen for these and you, you can look at huge numbers of men for huge number of these genes to try and work out what, what the risk profile is. The seminal work in prostate cancer has come from Ros Eels and the Practical Consortium and they've published their sort of third stage follow-up now. At each point they've screened a large number of men and controls for millions of these different gene combinations. They've taken the hips from the first lot, put them into the second lot and moved them into the third lot. And so they've come up with a validation of where they've screened men who are African, Asian, Australian, Caucasian, European, American. And they've come up with a hit of seven regions where you get prostate cancer. Now, I put this table up to baffle everybody. I don't expect anyone to read this. If, if you can read it at the back, you get a prize. Okay. But what, what it effectively says is there's lots of different populations tested and the risks are not particularly great. This table's even worse, so you're not expected to read this. But the summary is... The summary is that between 6% and 50% of men carry these genes, or carry the risks in these genes, okay? So up to half of us have got a risky gene in us. But if we carry one of those genes, it marginally adjusts our odds. So our odds might go down to as low as 0.7, so we might be 70% less likely to go to somebody else. Or they might go up by 1% to perhaps up to 1.27. So we all carry these things, or a lot of us carry them, but, as a single fact, they don't adjust our risk much. If you plot them all out on a frequency, what you can see is the top 10% of those men who've got this risk profile in this group, 
they got a 2.3 fold increase in prostate cancer. The top 1% have got a 3 fold risk. So perhaps, and this is what people are now propagating, that perhaps you could use these genes to map a population and say you're three times more likely to get prostate cancer than somebody else. Would you like dutasteride or finasteride? Or would you like, perhaps, if you're in the other end, if you've got a 0.3% chance, shall we not even bother with PSA testing? Shall we just get you off the radar? And that's gaining momentum at the moment. The big downside is that their outcome here is prostate <coughs> cancer. It's not significant disease, it's not dying of it, it's just having prostate cancer. So inevitably it's going to lead to more over-detection of more indolent, less worrying disease if we go down this road. But the data is out there now and these stuffs are all patented, there are now companies producing gene tests. You can go on the internet and get your company decode in Iceland will give you a risk profile for 50 different diseases from this information. So we are encountering people who are having this information and knowing their gene profile. What is interesting is perhaps 20% of families can be, can be explained by this sort of low risk combinations all up together. So that's potentially one way we could modify risk. The next thing is trying to not detect it. So perhaps we should look for men in who've uh, got longevity, stop screening those over 67, as I'll show you why in a minute, take those with any risk factors, um, or use risk calculators, and these are very popular, there's even a BlackBerry version of the nomogram one, you can see here, uh, I'll show you why it's rubbish in a minute. Um, <laughs> this is the uh, European one, where you can go on the net and you can put in your PSA or your family registry, and it tells you your risk of prostate cancer. It looks very convincing, it looks very nice, they're great pictures, aren't they? But they're not really that accurate, to be honest, and there's never any mention made of that when you're coming out with your risk profiles. Um, I think the biggest problem with over-detection is that the, the, the genie's out of the lamp. We, we know about PSA, you can't go back again. I don't think we could start controlling PSA. So I think we're going to struggle with over-detection, if I'm honest, because people are demanding their rights to know it, and we're seeing a mass propagation of PSA testing in the UK. So I think that the solution to the prostate cancer screening conundrum comes in treatment and trying to be much more rational in who we treat and treat them in a much more rational manner. And we're going to hear later this morning from Chris Parker about surveillance and I think that probably is the key, uh, but it's finding the right men. Does early versus late prostatectomy matter if you get the right patients? So this is the European screening study. They've got all the good guys, so the T1Cs, the low PSAs, the low PSA densities, the Gleason 6s, only one biopsy positive, and they followed them up. And what you see with time is that there's no difference in the survival. So, so if they have an early or a late radical prostatectomy, it doesn't matter. You can find the right people and monitor them, probably. The same has been shown by the Swedish Cancer Registry. So this is the, the Swedes again. They've got a huge PC base. I found out here that it is law in Sweden to fill out a cancer registry. So if you're a doctor, so here are John, when we have to write our letters to the GPs, we get told off. If you're a doctor in Sweden and you don't fill out the registry information, you're breaking the law, and you can have a fixed penalty or go to jail. So perhaps we should do that. Anyway, so their data, not surprisingly, are 98% compliant. So there's 2% of jailbirds out there refusing to help. But anyway, once again, you see no survival difference between immediate and delayed radical prostatectomy. But hang on, if you look at delay, it's only 16 months. I mean, that's a year, isn't it? Some of our men take a year to decide they want de definitive treatment. So, so I'm not sure that's really the best evidence. What they have got, the same registry, they've looked at their long-term outcomes. So we have nearly 6,000 men, which they think, six, nearly 7,000 men, which they estimate is 90% all Swedish cancers. Bear in mind, everyone's filling out these records because they don't want to go to jail. So they have a pretty good idea about what's going on. And what they see is that, now it's hard to see the back, surveillance is black, your natural life expectancy is red, they overlap. In appropriate people, if you're surveyed, it matches your life expectancy, it doesn't cause a detriment. But if you treat them radically, with surgery or radiotherapy, they actually do better than they're supposed to. So there is a survival benefit there, but it's a marginal one. And this is relatively good data, because it's everyone across the population chucking in their data. Um, what we do see, and I'm glad Peter Kirkbride walked in, what we do see is surgery is better than anything. So here we see monitoring radiotherapy. And survival is best with radical prostatectomy. We all know that. I'm sure it's not an artifactual bias to do with the economics of a case selection, but that's a marginal thing they show. So we see that surveillance is good and safe in the right hands, and there's good data to support that. So we've got to work out who, it, who is appropriate for surveillance. And I won't talk on Chris, uh, Chris Parker's talk, but just to sort of put the biomarkers into the context. It's really about the patient and the cancer. The first thing is the patient. 
So this is the life expectancy in 2009 for men across the world. And, and you can see that if you live in a rich North American or European country, your life expectancy is into the 80s. If you live in sub-Saharan Africa or uh, any of those sort of failed states around there, it's near 40. So there's no point screening for prostate cancer there. There's a massive boom in prostate detection in China and various places, but you wonder at the moment whether their life expectancy is sufficient to justify that. Um, there are good data on life expectancy out there. And the reason I said 67 earlier is that 67 is the age in America where your life expectancy drops below 15 years. So perhaps that should be an upper limit. We should try and use an evidence-based approach. In fact, you now go on the internet to work out what your life expectancy should be. So these are the factors you can plug into a program. So I'm going to live till I'm 87, which is great news. Uh, the good thing for me is that uh, my parents are quite old. Uh, my grandparents are quite old and I've got a good personality. <laughs> <laughs> the bad thing is that I'm a man and my parents are quite old. So work that one out. But it, you, have, you can have some estimated ideas about what your life expectancy should be and therefore perhaps target men appropriately. The area where biomarkers as a whole is going to come into place are the cancer. And can we predict how aggressive the cancer is? And yes, we obviously can by various things. The easiest is stage of diagnosis. If you've got a T1C, a T2A, you do a lot better than a T3. That's not rocket science. Grade is also important. In nearly every study you look at, grade is the one independent factor that tells you how bad that tumour is going to be. So if you know the grade of the tumour accurately, then you know pretty likely whether, that, whether the patient's going to die from their disease or not. The problem we've got is knowing whether the disease, knowing the grade accurately from biopsy data, as I'll show you in a minute. There are factors out there that are being explored to try and add to this information. So the first one that we all have heard of is PSA kinetics. So either PSA doubling time, PSA velocity, they're slightly different factors, but effectively what the PSA is doing over time. And Anthony Damico had a very good paper out in the New England Journal. They looked at 1,000 men prior to prostatectomy and showed that if your PSA went up by two in the year before it, you had a much worse outcome than if it didn't. Um, I'm not a very good statistician, but there's a guy called Andrew Vickers in Memorial Sloan Kettering who's a genius, and he's coming to talk at the prostate, about sexual oncology on prostate cancer, so you, you should all go and watch him because he's a genius. He's done a systematic review to look at PSA versus PSA kinetics. Does the kinetics add anything over the PSA? And he's looked at 83 different papers over time. He's looked at all the raw data, and he's concluded, and so I'm going to trust him because he knows more than I do, that there is little evidence that the PSA kinetics or doubling time or velocity add anything over the absolute PSA level as a whole. So he feels at the moment that it's up a blind alley and perhaps the PSA as a whole is as useful as PSA is going to get. And I think that, that kind of makes some sense to me. I don't see many men whose PSA is going up more than two nanograms per mil a year at the moment where I'm thinking radical treatment. The area where I think we have got some positive work to go with is PSA isoforms. So PSA in the blood, as I alluded to earlier, is not just PSA, it's a whole host of things. So this HK2, the sister molecule of PSA, is also androgen regulated. It also goes up in prostate cancer, down in other diseases. So that's a good marker. PSA can be complexed to one of these proteins, or it can be free. And if it's free PSA, it might be what's called NICT, which is the proper mature formed PSA, or it could be pro-PSA, which is immature, accidentally spilt out too early. And that tends to go with cancer. You can think about it, cancer's not evolving, not differentiating properly. The tumour puts out more of this immature stuff because it's turning over rapidly. So perhaps using combinations of these PSA sisters and isoforms, it might be that we can get some more information. And the key worker there is Hans Lilia again, who's in uh, New York and uh, Malmo. And again, he works with Andrew Vickers, the statistician. And they've looked at various PSA isoforms, and they've come up with a panel of four. Now again, what's important here are these sort of red boxes. So, if you take a straightforward, and Andrew does this nicely, you have a thousand men who've got a raised PSA, and you, and you apply the models to a thousand men, how do the models help you work out if you're doing good or bad? Well, the first thing is, can you detect cancer in those thousand men? And these are the area under the curve, okay? So, using just PSA, you pick up about 64% of the cancers. If you add in the, uh, all the isoforms, you can make that near a 77%. For high-grade disease, it's better, though. You pick up 77% of PSA, but you can get that up to, into the mid-80s, 83%, if you um, use these isoforms. But what I really like is the numbers needed to screen and the numbers needed to treat if we were to apply it to this population. So, if you have your 1,000 men, if you use PSA, you're going to biopsy 
a significant number and you're going to pick up those cancers down there. So you can see here, you'll do, have 1,000 men, you'll do uh, 700 biopsies, you'll pick up 223 cancers of which 93 will be high grade. If you apply those models, you're going to biopsy uh, 480 as opposed to 700, you're going to miss potentially six can 60 cancers of which 12 will be high grade. They've done that in three different cohorts now. A North American cohort, they've taken a bunch of men, several tens of thousands from the European screening study, and they've taken um, a group from Gothenburg, the data we saw earlier. And in those populations, they see that if you apply these panels, you almost halve the number of biopsies you have to do to the population, but it's at the expense of missing some low-grade cancers. So you miss a th almost a third of low-grade cancers but you only miss a small number of high-grade cancers. So you miss 3 out of 40 high-grade cancers in one group, or 12 out of 10 in another group. So it's whether we're, as a society, prepared to um, realise we're going to miss some low-grade cancers, some high-grade cancers, for the vast improvement for the rest of the population. And that's for us to work with. But I think biopsies are the other area we need to exploit more in, in, in urology. So we should be able to determine, on biopsy, the small, low-grade tumour from the high-grade high stage tumour. What I see in our population, and, and again up here I've looked at the UK data from the PROTEC study, is that biopsy is pretty good at picking up bad disease. If it's bad, you know it's bad. So we can pick up T3, Gleason 4 or high volume. So here we've used, uh, here I've broken up uh, 600 radical prostatectomy specimens. I've, I've broken them down into their PSA value and the biopsy criteria, so how many biopsies were positive. And the red box tells you that if you've got a lot of biopsies that are positive, the high PSA, you've got a bad cancer. On the other hand, we're not very good at knowing if you've got a good cancer. So you know if it's bad, but you don't know if it's good. So if you've got very little cancer on the biopsy, up to 60% of them have still got significant disease. We know from pathology, we know from radical prostatectomy specimens what insignificant disease is. We know that you have a small, low volume at least six tumour. And people do very well with those tumours. So if you take the radical prostatectomy specimens, you find the insignificant disease, you nearly never die of disease if you've got that disease. And that's well validated. The query we have is whether you can detect that from biopsy parameters or traditional biopsy parameters preoperatively. These are the ones that are suggested to go with it. So low PSA, low PSA density, uh, no elements of the Gleason 4, only three cores involved, and less, less than 50% only one core. Um, but if you take those criteria, up to about a quarter of men have got actually worse disease that you've missed. So either Gleason 4 elements or T2, T3 tumours. Uh, uh, and up to a third of them are upstage T3 according to the sort of final pathological criteria. So as a whole, they're not particularly reliable. Certainly not reliable enough that you could write off a quarter of the, men, a quarter of the male population. So to try and improve that, people have come up with nomograms and this sort of integration of all the data together. And this is coming back to those BlackBerry uh, algorithms that I showed you earlier. The same people are producing the same algorithms for various clinical scenarios, and they look very appealing. But when you break down to the raw data, you see um, receiver operator curves like these. Now what that means is that um, these numbers here tell you how true and how likely the nomogram is to be accurate across the population. So it means that if you have a base model here, which is just PSA as a whole, not using any sort of other features, it gets it right in 64% of the time. Now, tossing a coin will get it right 50% of the time. So you've got to be quite a lot better than 50% to justify it. So if you use all the known gram and all the computational programming you come with it, you get it right about 80% of the time. So you get it wrong 20% of the time. And you don't really read about that in these known grams when you see them advertised. They're only, they're only right in 80% of men. And they're only right in 80% of North American screen-detected men. If you look at it across other populations, okay, so the European group here gets down to the mid-70s. If you apply the known grams to the British population, so this is the PROTECT data, it's only right in 60% of the men. So actually, they're probably not that reliable. But they look very nice, they're characteristic toys, you can see why people like them, but they're not particularly reliable. This is what we see in the UK at the moment. So this is the PROTECT prostatectomy cohort, a bunch of them. What I've done is I've select those who've got very good biopsy characteristics. So low PSA, less than a third of the cores are positive. They've only got Gleason 6. They've got no more than 10 millimetres of cancer in total across the board, and no cores got more than 7 millimetres. So they're about the lowest risk that we see reliably. They represent 26% of the UK screen population at the moment. 
but they represent probably about 70 to 80% of the European screen populations. Of this group, 25% have got T3 or Gleason 4 to 5 disease. So you're missing a quarter of men who've got significant disease. And of the group who haven't, over half of them have got pathologically insignificant disease. So you're left with a quandary that the biopsies are telling you on one hand that it's good, and the vast majority of men have got disease that doesn't need treating. But on the other hand, you're missing a quarter of men who've got significant life-threatening disease. And that's why I think we need to sort of improve our biopsy strategies. I think we've got to adopt more biopsies, we've got to get more information using template protocols, try and map the prostate more reliably, try and exclude those people who've got the 25% of Gleason 4, because we should be able to find those. And perhaps a period of surveillance in the low risk people to start with would be the way forward. So the title of my talk is Biomarkers, so I'll throw a bit in, in at the end just to sort of give a, give a picture and, and a slightly bleak view. Um, the biggest news in biomarkers at the moment is to do with gene fusions, and this was discovered in prostate cancer. And what's happening here is that you've got an uh, androgen responsive gene, which is this temporous one up here, and so this is normally controlled by androgens, and it's been bolted onto a growth factor. So in cancer, suddenly you've got a growth factor that should be controlled by one thing, being controlled by androgens. So suddenly your testosterone makes your cancers grow much faster. And it's discovered uh, in the 2005 by a urologist, um, and it's really set the field alight. And we now realise that probably a third to two thirds of prostate cancers have got these sorts of fusions going on. And they are very good because they're very abnormal. If you look at them in blood or urine, as shown here, the presence of this sort of fusion in multivariate analysis is highly, highly specific for prostate cancer because it's not normal, it's not PSA, it's not a human cavakine. It isn't normal. If you've got this reaction going on, then it's very specific. The problem is, they're not very sensitive. A third of prostate cancers don't have anything like this going on. So it may well be that in the future, we use it to target certain men or to molecularly screen certain men. <coughs> um, but nothing else is particularly set in the field of light. PCA3 is floating out there, being marketed, and there is some success with it, but it's not particularly specific of significant disease, to my mind. Um, and the other one that's raising its head on the horizon is the EPCA2, which is an early prostate cancer antigen that's being marketed by James Hopkins that seems to be fairly reliable. Uh, it looks nice on the data here, so you've got benign controls going through various other cancers to prostate cancer cases. The problem is that you're going to find a lot of men around this red line, there's going to be a lot of crossover between the top of that group and the bottom of that group, and you're going to be in a similar conundrum to PSA, really, I think. So, in summary, um, screening saves lives, but at the extent of over-treatment. Um, to try and reduce biopsy rates, we, there are strategies such as the PSA isoforms, um, and they could be used, but we have to work, we have to realise that we're going to miss a small proportion of high-grade tumours at the cost of them. But the vast majority of the population will benefit. Um, I think the real immediate solution lies in more information from biopsies, trying to more accurately predict those who need treatment and try and more accurately map those who probably don't need treatment. Um, there's no miraculous biomarkers I know of on the horizon, um, and we obviously are all here to detect significant prostate cancer rather than other diseases. And the final thing is, I don't think we're that bad in prostate cancer. We're probably not making the same mistakes as we made in other tumours. Um, and I think we have a, a, a window of opportunity to try and get this right rather than uh, launching into widespread screening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. That was a tremendous overview, and I think you rightly say there's no new biomarkers on the horizon that are that exciting. I think you're right in terms of focusing on the PSA and working out strategies as to how we can actually risk stratify patients. It's not just a single test, is it? And I suspect the genetic studies that are going on are going to narrow the field into those that we should be looking at more closely. But let me throw another idea out at you. You mentioned Hans Lillian yeah. is let's do the PSA at a single sitting and work out things from there. Um, PSA level at 60, an isolated PSA screening test, one off in men at the age of 60. I'll set the scene for you. Aneurysm screening, they do a single ultrasound scan. You either have or haven't got an, uh, an aneurysm. Colon cancer, single fetal occult blood, you're in the system or you're not. What do you think the place may be for a single PSA test in a man age 60, rather than thinking about should we be going down the full screening pathway? 
Well, you're going to uncover a lot of men who've got a raised PSA. What, 20% of the population have got a raised PSA, and of that, 20% have got cancer. So you're going to generate a lot of men who've got fluctuating PSAs, who've got um, various other diseases causing it. It's not the same as an abdominal ultrasound where it's a fairly static measurement. Or I mean, fecal occult blood, again, is not reliable. It's intermittent, you get bleeding from there. So I think the aneurysm screening data is probably the most convincing of a single test, a bit like phenarchetonuria. Uh, for PSA, I think it's more trends over time. I'm not sure a single thing. I think there would be an argument for perhaps younger men because they have less fluctuation. You saw the PSA data in the UK going up with time, but it also spreads with time. So perhaps you could do it in 40-year-old men and you'd have a much tighter group with less variance. The problem is you are going to find cancers in that group who you'd worry about treating. I'm persuaded that it is a good argument. And tomorrow there's a paper going to be published in the BMJ on just that precise point. It's not so much that you're going to detect a lot of unnecessary cancer, because we do that now. It's about the men who've got a PSA less than one at the age of 60. You can stop them worrying. You can stop putting them into this whole screening programme that we agonise about at the moment. Well, there's, there's data going on where, they, where they, you, you try and use the genetic profile. So there's a, there's a, a screening study in, in Denmark, the Jutland Peninsula, where they are, screen, they, are, they are screening everybody for these risk profiles. And if you've got a low risk profile, you then don't get a PSA test. So you try and prevent it before you even get there. So, yeah, you might be right. I mean, as you know, the problem is there's always going to be men with high grade disease who slip through the net. And you only take one or two failures to bring the whole system down because it's you know, publicity and also you undermine the whole power of your results. The strength of that paper tomorrow is it's a PSA cutoff of one. <laughs> now, questions from the floor, please. I don't know really, I don't know about consumer pressure because we're now seeing a backlash in breast cancer where there's a, a lot of publicity now about people who've had treatment for unnecessary ductal carcinoma in sight or whatever. So I, I don't know if I, I think you probably all have a better feel for public, public perceptions at the moment for prostate cancer screen than I do to be honest. Like, I think the field is really up in the air at the moment. I think I could see it coming down both sides. You, you've seen what's going on in North America now uh, uh, and there's no sort of rationale in the mid, rationale in the mid. It, I think there will be data that, that feed us or, or, or inform us, so we have the Protect treatment study that will tell us whether treatment for certain cancers is better than monitoring. We'll have the longer follow-up of the RSPC. I suspect at some stage we'll have screening for a targeted population that's defining who that population is at the moment. Any other questions? Welcome, please. Jim, I think one of the things that we've talked about here is how difficult it is to manage the PSA, but of course the community is much bigger than that. The prostate cancer charity has made a call for universal access to men to have all the information about PSA testing for them to decide whether they have the test or not. And I think that's a very important call because it goes back one stage further. It's not what's the best test, it's how do you access men who are at risk of this incredibly common disease. There was a study done by the prostate cancer charity, something like 47% of men between the age of 50 and 70 hadn't heard of the PSA test. You know, we've got a, we've got a two week trust clinic in Sheffield. If a patient's got an elevated PSA in Sheffield, they have to be seen within two weeks. And the way we structure it is they come to have a prostate biopsy. You know, that's a bit brutal, isn't it? We did a, an audit recently that showed that 27% of those men didn't even know they had a PSA test done. So it's a tricky one, isn't it? It's not just what's the best test, it's how do we translate what we know into the bigger community? Do you want to comment on that? Well, and, and it's at every level it's complex, isn't it? Unfortunately, the, the old days of you have cancer, it needs treatment are, are well gone, aren't they? And, and as medical professionals, we have trouble dealing with those issues, don't we? We have trouble equating what's the best rationale. So I don't think you can really expect a man on the street to have an informed, balanced opinion without some sort of guidance, I imagine. So 
it's like it's the likes of this charity to generate that. But there is consciousness raising, and I think the consumer pressure that comes from that paper is going to be reviewed in all the national papers. It's in the mail, it's in the front page, on the front page of the Daily Telegraph today. And you know, everyone's going to read that. And you know, everyone at the age of 60 will now be given a PSA test for their birthday. Won't they? <laughs> I can see it happening, but it's good to raise awareness, yes. Please, if you've got questions, it'd be nice for you to tell us who you are and where you come from. Pierre Herfey, um, from Guernsey, Channel Islands. What do you do, Pierre? I'm a clinical nurse specialist. Thank you. Um, I just want to say this, there's a great deal of um, what I appreciate, and it was very interesting to hear your, your, your um, talk. Um, there's a lot of conflicting information actually coming from the medical stroke nursing profession about what men should do. And uh, I was recently um, attending a, a conference where um, Michael Kirby was talking about the prostate cancer risk management program that's been recently updated and that basically provides information for men to make informed decisions about whether they should actually have the PSA test. And I think one of the things that was, um, was being emphasised within this, this, um, this information was the, the over-detection um, of, of prostate cancer, which, which you, you clearly illustrated in, in your talk. And it is a big concern um, because of the, 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 the high rate of indolent type prostate cancers uh, and, and the worry and the concern it's going to cause for men. Uh, and you just have to think of some of the age of 50 being told, oh, you've got prostate cancer, um, but actually it may not kill you. And it's, 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 it's a real dilemma. I think the, the guidance from the um, Prostate Cancer Risk Management Program is very useful, but it actually it sits alongside a lot of other information that's, that's around, and I think it's trying to work out, well, what, what, what do you take note of? It was too big, wasn't it? The document that went to all GPs got filed in the circular filing cabinet on the floor because it was too much to read. But it was a very good message, and it's one that we should try and probably simplify and put out into the wider community. And that may be something the Prostate Cancer Charity can work on. Any other questions or comments from the floor? Yes? Um, um, you, you said something about the first third of your um, presentation, which was about um, being able to predict from a man at the age of 20. Yeah. What kind of evidence is that? Well, that's the, the Hans Lilia's data. Yeah. So it's really the Gothenburg screening study where they, they, they've... Uh, there's an analogous study where they've been looking at various lifestyle factors to do with heart disease and the metabolic syndrome and diabetes. And so as a consequence of that, they had blood dating back for many men for 20 years before they got prostate cancer. And they were, so they were then screened as part of this Gothenburg screening study, found they had prostate cancer, they went back to their 20 year old samples and measured their PSAs there. And it, and it, it maps quite tightly, but it maps very, very, very accurately, really, for, for a single man. And so when you suggest, I know people have said PSA screening at 60, 40. Well, well I think if you think about the over detection, it's to do with age. And, and if you really want to find the disease that matters, you've got to look in the younger men. And I think the men we see, who are the breast cancer equivalents of the, you know, the young mothers dying of breast cancer, the tragedies are really the younger cohort. So I think actually we should be focusing on people before 60. I think we should be screening the younger population. Buying into this going to be an over, uh, there's going to be less over treatment because there's less indolent disease in that group, group but, you are being, but your treatment is going to have a bigger effect. Impotence is going to be more important in a man in their 40s or the 50s. But I think that's probably where the focus should probably be because they are going to live to get the metastases and suffer from it. Whereas the man in the 60, the 60 year old men, certainly are 60 year old men who come in from down the motorway or something like that, they're unlikely to run into problems in their 90s from their disease. <coughs> so I think if you, were, if you were picking up the disease earlier and treating it in that group, you're more likely to affect the, the natural history and have less over treatment. But the results are going to be more drastic of the treatment. Yeah, I think there's academic purity in what you say, but. Just how worrying is it for a 20-year-old to be told, you know, you're one of the ones who's going to get prostate cancer, but the rest of his life to live with it, isn't he? Whereas the study, this 60-year-old study, I think is quite attractive. Not because it's going to pick the people up who's got it, but it's going to rule out 50% of people who are unlikely ever to get significant disease, and that's the message from the paper tomorrow. Now, it's 10.30, and on the programme it says coffee. It's a great way to kick off with this topic. 
and I'm sure it's something that we can continue the discussions over coffee. Jim, I hope you're staying for coffee and we can talk there. And we're going to come back at 11 o'clock when we're going to start to look at investigating uh, prostate cancer, radiology, and then look at some of the uh, strategies that we have for treating prostate cancer. So go and meet each other, talk to each other, find out where you're from, come back at 11 o'clock and we'll kick off again promptly.